Awesome. Welcome everyone back to our TDOV project, our TDOV campaign. I'm so happy to be here with Arlo Cruz from Northern Colorado Access Point, uh, obviously, quite obviously in Colorado. So I'm just going to ask Arlo to introduce themselves and uh, yeah, we'll get into it. Um, hi, thank you um, for having me. My name is Arlo Cruz. Um, yes, I live in Fort Collins, Colorado. Um, I use he, they pronouns. Um, and anything I say here is not on behalf of the company. So these are all my own opinions um, and I do not represent the opinions of who I work for. Beautifully said, beautifully said, just like a Twitter bio, right? Yep, <laughs> I always gotta put that in there. <laughs> these likes are not endorsements, absolutely. So thank you for that, Arlo. Um, what's really interesting is since this whole project started and the campaign opened and we had our forums, I mean, you were, you were one of two people, I think, that were nominated multiple times, which is very interesting. So there was an immediate connection, really wanted to get to know you and your work. And the cool thing is now, months later, as the, the project has progressed, you've come to Lighthouse, you've been like a huge advocate. You got us started on Keybase for external communication. You've been just super engaged and helpful. Um, and I know we've had multiple conversations and we've kind of had this like budding friendship, which is great. But I think what I always like to open it up with uh, so people can get to know you better is really how did you first get into harm reduction and, you know, what role does that play in your day to day and in your life? Yeah, um, a lot of stuff there, but um, grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, um, left Phoenix, Arizona um, for many reasons, but um, a lot of it it was just, there wasn't great healthcare, there wasn't great access to things people needed. Um, syringe access was still illegal there at that time. Um, there's been a lot of great orgs, you know, fighting to get them where they needed because there is just a surge in overdoses, um, opiate overdoses in that area. Um, and then I lost a lot of friends. Um, I had previous use experience and it really just cultivated into me finding this position um, up here in Northern Colorado. Um, you know, I didn't leave Arizona for this job specifically, but um, came to Arizona or came to Colorado, got settled and then started getting to a place where I was ready to, to start giving back to my community. So um, previous to that, just a lot of involvement in mutual aid groups and, and things like that, so. Yeah, so it's like a mixture, and this is this is, you know, closely tied to a lot of people's experiences. That lived experience tied in with just like being generally pissed off and agitated that there's not enough movement. And you mentioned about you know Arizona um, not allowing syringe access or SSPs um, legally sanctioned ones. Legally yeah. sanctioned because we know <laughs> people are doing it out of the backseat of their car or their trunk, right? Absolutely. Um, so I think one of the things that's interesting is, so a lot of the people we've interviewed up to this point have been kind of on, on the East coast. So what about Colorado, you know, being kind of on mountain time and, and that being a difference, right? But what, what is the drug supply look like there? And kind of what are the trends that you're seeing there that you don't feel are maybe represented when we talk about the drug supply or kind of harm reduction over on you know, where I am. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it's really complicated. People think Colorado is this like safe haven for people who use drugs, um, especially with early on the legalization and decriminalization of marijuana. Um, but that has only heightened and put forth harsher laws against lick substances. Um, we recently had a fentanyl bill passed out here um that is basically if you have any substance that tests positive for fentanyl um you can get a felony and if it's over four grams whether you're having four grams of clear it tests positive for fentanyl they will still consider the whole um supply fentanyl and if it's over uh, three or four grams you can get a um a distribution intent to distribute charge um so it's automatically a felony so people are trying to go around that um and put other things into the supply that's not fentanyl so the biggest thing we're seeing right now is pyro um which is just a stronger opioid um 
and it's really hard to to keep folks like knowing what is what is in their supply and like with the like latest news of like this is what's in it um a lot of people don't know they just think it's like the blues are really strong this time but it's not even testing positive for fentanyl so yeah that's interesting because over here there's not so much the conversation about pyro and we know we've known even you know the drug supply looks very different from east to west um, and it's just not, it's really not consistent anywhere, to be honest. Like you re, you see online people put spike alerts or they'll put, they'll put, you know, like a picture of the drug with this and this and that, that they've tested, or if you have the privilege or the ability to even test, right? Using what is it? FITR. Um, but not everybody has that luxury, right? And even with the fentanyl test strips, I feel like there's a false illusion of safety and comfort there and being like, oh, I have this thing and now I can use this thing and I'll be OK every time, which we know um, they can often be unreliable. Some people don't know how to use them. They're extremely sensitive because what I always tell people is that they were originally made to test uh, metabolites in urine. Right. So think about how sensitive they have to be. Something has passed through your system. And then they were meant to to pick up on those things. So, and then the other added layer is just with the strips, testing MDMA or meth is different than when you're testing other substances, right? Yeah. So I guess what I'm curious is like, when you're doing your work, are you, how are you kind of approaching the conversation with the supplies? Like, what are you, how much are you giving out and how much education needs to be done? And like, I guess more of the question is, what does your day to day look like? Yeah, absolutely. Um, we, we really try to meet people where they're at um, and give them the time that they want to take um, with us. So if people just want to get supplies, get out the door, that's okay. But we have the system where we have kind of like a waiting area um, and we just go by like first come first serve. We sit down, we have like a room in the back where um, we keep track of basically like people's use, how, mu how many syringes they're getting. Um, and we give them the floor to just tell us what they need. Um, so everyone has the option to sit down, talk with us, um, discuss their needs, whatever resources they need. Um, when it comes to supplies we give out, um, we automatically, we don't do a one-for-one -one system. Um, people can get supplies regardless if they have anything to bring back. So automatically you get 40 sharps. Um, and then after that, we match up to 300. Um, we have a lot of folks from rural areas coming out um, and bringing their friends. Um, we can give out larger, you know, like the five gallon sharps containers. Um, you know, we have a, we're really lucky that our community takes care of each other. Um, there we always have people picking up supplies for others um, and just going out of their way to be like, hey, I don't inject anymore. I only smoke now, but I'm going to get sharps for my camp or for, you know, for my house to have around for people. So we're, we're very lucky. We've created a culture of people who want want to help each other. That's great, too, because we also know that like secondary exchange is one of the best ways to move supplies. And um, I know with some organizations, it's difficult, right? Like I, I can't speak for everybody. I just know from when I was working at an SSP, when we would give supplies, a lot of time we would have to encourage those other folks to come in and sign up but then realizing that sometimes that's the barrier, right? They don't want to be seen coming in the building. They don't want to interact with the van because we have the big logo on it. And um, especially when you're going to areas where it's a little bit more rural, that's a huge, that's a huge piece. And I don't know, are there a lot of encampments? Uh, I think we talked about this a little bit. Are there encampments in, in Colorado? Because people tend to kind of get huddled and pushed into areas. Oh yeah. So Denver is definitely, Denver and the Springs are more where there's encampments. Up here, so I'm about an hour and a half north of Denver. Um, it's much more rural. It's a smaller college town. Um, and as long as things, like, they don't want people to be seen, uh, the city. It's really hard. Um, people are being pushed out further and further. They put camping vans in Fort Collins, in Loveland, like in surrounding areas. 
Um, they're sweeping outside the day shelter. All of our like overnight shelters are religious organizations and people have a lot of religious trauma and are worried about going to, to the shelters. Um, but there's not really a good place for camps to be set up. So people are starting to set up on the outskirts of town and they're having to bike four or five miles just to get into town. And they don't have the supplies. It's whatever they can fit in their backpack they can take back to the camp. Um, so there's, there's definitely a housing issue. Um, we don't have a ton of housing up here for how, like our infrastructure doesn't support the amount of people we have up here. Um, I don't think people intended for Collins to, to grow to this size. Um, but we do have like a major, major housing issue right now. And with inflation skyrocketing, I think it's over 7% and just our, from last year from our, in our town, um, people just don't have the resources to, to provide, you know, for their families or for themselves. Absolutely. And I'm sure besides the harm reduction supplies, because we know that's such a small piece of harm reduction, right? Um, are you, do you have people who, who do all the referrals and like navigate and connect to other services and things? Because I know you talked about housing, but things like if, you know, inductions need to happen for BUP or, you know, uh, methadone or MOUD and things like that. Yeah, we're we're really lucky. Um, some of the managers previous um, to me getting there had started a very low barrier suboxone clinic with resident doctors um, from one of the trusted medical providers out here. Um, so doctors who go through the residency with this program have to do our program, at least to some extent. Um, so it, it's a good teaching opportunity for doc like new younger doctors to learn about what harm reduction is um again super low barrier like we only test for bup um and like it's just a really easy opportunity because it's in the same place people are getting supplies like we keep it separate like we don't we don't tell the doctors if they're getting supplies from us but we also like it's a really easy passageway to to get care um and then we do telehealth or they can come in if they don't have access to that. Um, and we do have a lot of folks who don't have phones or houses who, who are part of Suboxone who wouldn't normally be able to be on Suboxone if it wasn't for this program. Yeah, that's awesome. I'm so glad that you still have a telehealth option because I feel like people think we're in this post-COVID kind of world when it's still very much looming over communities. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I mean, over here, the conversation is, is, is very much like, oh, there's COVID and there's MPV. And then like in New York, there's polio and there's West Nile. And there's just like every yeah, West Nile out here for sure. Oh my gosh, it's, it's so yeah. many things, right? And then like who time and time again gets the brunt of it and feels the brunt of it, right? People who are low, um, low income, people are experiencing poverty, black and brown, indigenous folks, queer folks. Like that's why... <laughs> having things that are low barrier and creating more access is really what we have to deal with and what we have to do. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess the treatment and that's great. I'm glad that it's low barrier, but I'm also wondering too, what other kind of referrals or, or things have you had to adapt to, in order to serve the needs of Fort Collins? Yeah. Um... We're really lucky that we have a partner agency. It's it's the day shelter. Um, it's ran by an organization called Homeward Alliance. And um, they do everything resource-wise. So like our team is a team of four people. So we're very small. Um, finally just hired a fourth person, um, which we're very lucky to have. Um, they're wonderful. Uh, we have a wonderful team, um, but we do have to bring outside like resource navigators in to fill that need. So every Monday, um, I actually invited somebody from from that partner agency to come in and they can do housing vouchers. They can help sign people up for Medicaid. They can get their ID and they have vouchers to pay for it. They can get mail. Um, anything you want. They even help with like distant, long distance transportation and stuff. So um, 
they're in every Monday for about four to five hours during our service hours. Um, so after people get supplies, if they need their ID or they want like employment counseling or whatever, as long as they're like at risk for homelessness or they are unhoused, um, they can access those services. So that's awesome. And it takes a lot of stress off of your team that, you know, the lack of capacity. I'm glad that you have a fourth person because I remember when I first started talking, you're like, no, it's just me and my two. <laughs> two yeah, it's my boss and my my partner and that's it um exactly right like and that speaks too to how underfunded harm reduction programs are and trying to do everything with a shoestring budget is not easy and i think the other thing is too your so your organization is part of a larger like network of organizations too so can you talk a little bit about how you all network or how many um you know kind of locations there are in the network yeah, um, so all of the syringe access programs all started out as individual AIDS projects. So ours was Northern Colorado AIDS Project, or Southern Colorado AIDS Project, um, Denver Colorado AIDS Project, and then um, Colorado Health Network. Basically, the AIDS projects were going under, they were about to close down, they had no funding from the city or like individual funders. So a bigger company came and basically engulfed our organizations, but that's what they needed to keep keep the doors open. Um, and so that is a HIV prevention and they do services for people living with HIV. So they do in like the Denver office, they have medical care there for people living with HIV. They have like full food bank, housing, like they have like their own, like it's basically like almost like apartments that they, can get people like housing into and stuff so um it, they have a very like developed and like robust program for people living with hiv uh, um and we're still kind of building for the the preventative service portion of it um we have locations in uh, fort collins Greeley, which is about 45 minutes east of us but they don't have syringe access services there because it's, we're still working with the city to get that um safely implemented uh, Denver, Colorado Springs, Pueblo, and Grand Junction, which is very west, almost to Utah, so. Yeah, and I'm sure in each of those communities too, there's such unique and differing needs between them. Like you've talked about, you know, obviously Denver is a bigger city and there's a little bit more robust, more resources there, right? And then Fort Collins, which is kind of burgeoning, still <laughs> rural, and like you said, it's that you can't fit everything in. Yeah, and we have a really small office. We have to refer out for medical care. We do have a housing individual, but they, we don't have any like concrete housing solutions the way that they do down in Denver right. um, or people specifically living with HIV. So right, and I think this is a good segue to talk about what we mostly talk about in the collective or queer folks. So our community and like. I'm, I'm curious, and for people who aren't familiar with Colorado, can you just kind of give us an overview of like the landscape of like LGBTQIA advocacy or kind of, you know, even in your in your view, your direct service role, you know, the the queer clients that you're seeing, what the needs are, kind of what, what the service delivery is for them, that'd be helpful. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I'm still pretty new to Colorado. I haven't even been here for two years. Um, and I've only been in Fort Collins, so I can't really speak too much outside of the Fort Collins metro and some of the more rural areas out here. Um, Colorado is looked at as a very, like, queer-friendly, very, you know, like, liberal paradise. Um, but there's definitely pockets where it's still really hard for for lgbtq people to to be um we again like the denver metro seems like there's been a lot more advocacy work down there up here we don't have a ton of stuff we have stuff like associated with the college we have one youth group which is not <laughs> which the school system and stuff like that have issues being okay with. Um, and there's just not a, there's not really a ton of services up here. And if you are on the outskirts of Fort Collins in a more rural town, um, there's nothing, there's not really a community. Um, there, there's not a ton of services and there, there is a community, but it's, it's very small and tight knit and, um, 
people are definitely like weary of of outsiders and the way like people have been treated in the past. So um, when it comes to services, I mean, we we are one of the only like kind of queer centered service with our with our HIV services. We do do like free testing um, for HIV, Hep C, chlamydia, gonorrhea, and we're starting syphilis. Um, which is awesome, but like without the support network, um, it's it, I think it's really difficult for folks. So to define that that sense of community out here. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so it's kind of almost like a like a patchwork kind of thing, which is not uncommon, right? And community queer community tends to find one another and stick to one another, mm -hmm. or just be isolated, which we know has really deleterious effects. And a lot of what you're saying too reminds me of the last conversation I had with Zari um, and them talking about how they've had to do, you know, like name change, document navigation for trans folks and just thinking about like the capacity that oftentimes, like we always talk about, it comes up again and again that like queer staff, trans staff always has that kind of burden put on their shoulders to perform and provide the services directly to our communities because we know that nobody else is going to understand, nobody else is going to do it, but then running the risk of burnout or not having that um, support, whether that's from the community or whether that's from the organization, it it just makes it really difficult. Yeah. And again, this is my experience not being here very long, but we do have some really wonderful like trans elders in the community who have, have been very like guiding and who are trying to make like concrete policy changes and systematic changes. Um, we have this wonderful individual, their name's MJ, um, and they put on these wonderful events that are, that are trying to focus like, you know, like queer center, BIPOC center care, especially in Colorado with it being such a straight white, you know, liberal area, um, all of almost nearly all of Colorado. <laughs> Um, so it, it's great that we do have people in the community who are advo like, you know, advocating for better treatment, better, you know, just like rights around, around things. Cause again, even the name change up here is almost like $300 to do. It was is more than that. Is what? there a fee waiver or is that just, that's um, just no arguing with it? I'm curious. We, I know there's orgs that will like foot the bill for it. Okay. Um, I haven't done my name change yet because of all of the barriers put into place and um, there there's organizations that will help. Um, I think we have the name change project out here um, and they'll walk you through all the paperwork and everything, which is wonderful. But again, that's like centered in Denver. So if you don't have internet access or a phone, like you can't do any of that. Even if they can fit the bill, like it's not always accessible in these more rural areas. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. I'm very curious to see how people work it out. Cause there's, again, it's a patchwork of, of funding, grants, you know, information organizations. I feel like there's a new organization popping up like every five minutes that's trying to support someone in the community. And it's like, oh my goodness. I mean, it's good and it's bad, right? Like we need more resources, especially pushed towards people of color, right? Mm -hmm. Who are TGNC, NB and but at the same time, if it's on social media, it doesn't mean that somebody's automatically gonna know about it all the way out in Colorado. That's why I keep asking people when we're doing this project, like, please give me resources that you found value in, ones that you'd like to pass on to somebody else, because I don't think a single person has given me an overlapping resource, which says a lot, right? <laughs> yeah, about these these big like national wide orgs, they're like not reaching a lot of people. And it's hard to figure out what can reach people because especially we know that social media can be tiring. Yeah. Um, and in like the self-care aspect of like not 24 seven being on social media, it's really hard to make connections across the country. Um, when, when again, a lot of people don't have access to it or don't have like the capacity to deal with social media all the time. So Absolutely. there needs to be better ways for, for advertisement for services like this. And word of mouth just isn't cutting it right now. No, no, because things are still weird and things are still fractured, you know, since 
COVID and I mean, things I imagine were even difficult. I know you've only been there since pretty much COVID times two years ago, you said, but I imagine before, even with rural communities, the communication that's always been an issue. And then with the compounding issue of COVID and you have to stay apart and then you have, you know, MPV going on and people are worried about it getting into encampments and then you have other other things going on. You're trying to make sure people know their status and they're getting tested and they have supplies. I mean, it's just, yeah. it takes a village really. And we don't, especially for like, like monkeypox, they, we don't have the supply of, of vaccines for it out here. And they're only giving it basically to, to gay men or trans folks who have had sex with somebody in the last 14 days that they don't know or can't reach again. Yep. Or yeah. if you've had a, a, but that takes out the entire unhoused population who are living in close quarters, especially with like winter approaching, like we're going into fall, people have to get ready for 15 inch, you know, snowstorms, you know, so people just aren't, aren't getting the resources that they need. And especially they're sweeping all the camps. And right now people are trying to solidify and get ready for winter. Right. Yeah, they're being displaced and they're having to think about, oh my gosh, do I have my tarp? Do I have this? Do I have, you know, a heat source and do I have blankets and warm socks? And that's a mess. That's an absolute mess. Um, I want to go back to something that you mentioned earlier about self-care, because I do like to ask people because of what you mentioned about social media being so heavy and difficult and just the nature of the work we do is so heavy and it's very personal to us. I want to know how does Arlo keep himself relatively sane, right? And like just functioning on a daily basis. Yeah, um, man, some days it's hard, uh, not gonna lie. Um, I like to do a lot of things, like I like to make bread um, and I've been experimenting with like making jam and, and I'm from Arizona where like, you don't have farmer's markets or like, you know, anything like that. So I've been trying to live my best cottage core life i guess um so every day my partner gets home from i was like what are you making now i'm like i'm trying to get a sourdough starter um or i'm trying to make kombucha or hot sauce or you know just just things that i can just like not think about everything going on and it's hard to when it's something i've lived in for so long and like i kind of have a privilege now to divorce myself for a couple hours a day from like all this shit that's going on out here. And it's hard to to get out of that. It's hard to be at work and do this all day and to like really like be able to empathize and like feel what these what what people in my community are feeling. And then I need to come home and just like let it go. Um it feels impossible. It's right. Like, it's not just a jacket you can take off. No, it's not something you can just stop thinking about when it's something that has been a part of your life, your entire life. Because at one point I didn't have the privilege to stop thinking about this kind of stuff. Um, and so I really, I really try to lean into my community. Um, I really lean into my partner who works at the day shelter in this area. Um, my dogs, they're wonderful. Um, and I just have a really good group of, you know, like-minded friends who are interested in the same thing. And we really try to like stop working for like an hour or two a day, like just stop thinking about what's yeah. going on or planning. And, and I'm involved in the mutual aid groups pretty heavily out here. So my outside of work is just organizing and planning and, you know, distributing and, you know, it's hard to take a break from it. Um, yeah, it absolutely is. And, you know, I would hope you find validation in knowing that every single person so far up to this point that I've interviewed, we have all talked about this aspect and how difficult it is to use your words to divorce yourself from this, right, from the work, but also acknowledging that you deserve it and to be able to show up every day, you need to preserve your energy and take that sick day, use your PTO, like not feel guilty about it, right? Because we're very much stuck not to speak platitudes, but in this capitalistic mindset that we constantly have to produce. And then we're made to feel bad, especially if we have a small team and I'm not throwing shady organization, but like, man, I'm one of four people. If I'm not there, we can't 
do X thing or Y outreach or, mm. you know, who's going to do that? Nobody maybe knows how to, how to do phlebotomy or, you know, I, I get it when we were, when I, last place I worked, we started very small and then they had since expanded even after the time that I had left, I'm no longer there, but I was the only person who was bilingual. So if somebody came in speaking Spanish and I wasn't there, there really wasn't um, anybody to provide services to that person. And that's not fair, right? Like there's a huge- yeah. And that puts the pressure on you to have to, to be perfect, which none of us are. <laughs> Absolutely. And the other thing that's so important about what you talked about is mutual aid, because this is really the common thread as well. Every single conversation, I think one of the quotes that I pulled out, if you've seen the post, always has to do with mutual aid and just the lack of uh, government involvement, like true government involvement to the point where they're supporting the needs of the people, right? So I'm not sure what your mutual aid looks like or what, um, you know, you're kind of wrapping around because normally it's, you know, in helping people with their rent or getting food or clothing and things like that. Um, yeah. Yeah, we're definitely um, a pretty small group of folks and we, we do most of our fundraising via social media or um, we've teamed up with a really wonderful organization out here called Blast and Scrap, um, which my organization also teams up with. Um, and they are, they actually put on shows out here and their whole, um, their whole thing is uh, music meets mutual aid. So every show is donation based. Um, they'll never turn anyone away. The person who runs it is a person in recovery. Um, and they have a harm reduction table at every show. They have um, food, clothing, um, and they have these mutual aid groups at every show to just try to get it into the community more into a whole other part of the community we're not reaching because you know even if if you are housed there are especially out here a lot of kids that are struggling with substance use issues who, who can't talk to their parents or their doctor or they don't have anyone to talk to so i've had kids as young as like 15 16. Wow. i had like a 13 year old come up to me and they're like doing blues and you know, they don't have any of the, they don't know anything about overdose. They don't, you know, and they've had friends die and they're not being given the resources. We've even had overdoses in schools. Wow. So it's a small town. There's not a ton to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, right. you know, we see some of that trend that goes on like small Midwestern towns of, you know, of people not having the resources so a lot of a lot of kids dying mm -hmm. so oh, we're trying to expand into all directions obviously our our focus or um you know people who are injecting substances people who are smoking substances who are unhoused who don't have these resources but we have heavily been trying to expand within like lgbtq youth and within the music scene um because i go to these events and i have four five six different people every time we go telling me about, you know, recent deaths in the community. Yeah, it seems almost never ending, right? And this is a particular significance too, because at the time we're recording this, it's post International Overdose Awareness Day, right? And at the beginning we weren't recording yet, but Arlo and I were just talking about, you know, how our days went and just how heavy it is. But, you know, it's, it's this constant struggle between there's action going on or what we hope is is meaningful action that it's going to produce you know having a safer supply decriminalization overdose prevention centers you know just even be able to fund harm reduction programs but it's also having to preserve your energy after grieving because it's also a day to remember right everybody that we've lost because at this point i don't know if i know anybody who doesn't know someone who passed away due to overdose right it's just ubiquitous it's everywhere yeah it was pretty we've had a couple different events but the one yesterday was was pretty heavy um we did some like craft and reflection activities during our service hours and then we had the the mutual aid groups come in and they made like barbecue and mashed potatoes and coleslaw and like just like a hearty dinner that people like don't get 
mm -hmm. uh, very often out here if they're unhoused. And um, we had a candlelight vigil. We let people speak and really just opened up the floor for people to like talk and tell their story and feel safe telling people about what's happened to them and how yeah. they're coping with it. Um, so we had a really good moving night with people last night. It was it was really, really difficult, but, but I think it brought it definitely brought people together. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's always difficult taking that pain and putting it and turning it into, you know, something that's meaningful and something that, you know, we hope that nobody's life is in vain, right? And trying to move it forward. But we also, again, it's going back to like having that burden placed on your shoulders of feeling like you need to move the world right for all of these things because yeah. we're like who else is caring about this mm -hmm. yeah the harm i hear that i hear that from the folks we serve all the time is like what it, it just feels like such a heavy burden that they're they're put in charge of like saving people's lives so i think it's just a really difficult thing for them to have to deal with all of their own issues and all these other things going on and then have to come to an event like this and like still like feel like they're having to take up care of other people they don't have like a moment to just take care of themselves right absolutely <laughs> you're back here but um, no, okay. I was gonna say the dog has a lot to say about it very passionate about her very passionate she runs in this family <laughs> <laughs> so I think um because i can't believe we're already over a half an hour one of the things that i like to i know time flies one of the things i like to close with is i always like to ask everybody what is your hope like what are your kind of like hopes and dreams for harm reduction for the movement as a whole yeah um man i could talk all day about this one um i I really want to see, obviously, supervised injection sites out here um, or just supervised use sites, uh, mm -hmm. consumption sites. We have this really wonderful advocate down in um, Denver. Her name's Lisa Rayville with the Harm Reduction Action Center. Um, and she's just laid the groundwork for getting this started. Um, we have some more bills that need to be passed to make it like fully legalized. Um, but I think having that and then like inclusive healthcare that aligns with with people's actual needs um, who use substances. Um, my dream is a big clinic that is a walk-in clinic on one side, supervised consumption site on the other. Um, and then obviously syringe access, people can get all their supplies there. Um, and then having like actual like good like P wood case management services. So if we can get like all of those in one place, um, like I, that's gonna give people like a better start. Um, Cause a lot of the times we have folks who have abscesses or have like these other really concerning health cares that are linked to injection use and they're not getting help for it. I know especially y'all are seeing out there with the xylazine like it can tear up your skin yes. and yeah there's like a high rate of amputations right now and things like that and if we can avoid all of that with like things like safer supply like health care that is like inclusive of people who use drugs and the the supervised consumption sites um i think there's a lot that can can happen and one of my goals for the future is also organizing like a drug users union out here so um i don't even know where to start with all that um i've had clients ask me like is there a union out here and i was like no like not well, that i know of to be quite honest i mean that is something you and i can talk about offline because there are plenty of people over here on the on the east coast um who have organized and started that from the ground up and you know, you don't need to reinvent the wheel. Often what I tell people, if you've kind of envisioned it before, somebody else probably had that idea, right? But they okay. maybe didn't have the resource or the, or the time, but it's all lessons learned. And if anything else with the harm reduction community, I've found very much so that the people that are really about it, they want to see everybody succeed everywhere. So like, that's absolutely something that I think, like everything that you're saying, I'm smiling because there are things that I'm seeing 
bud around the country and like people are manifesting them and speaking truth to it and giving life to these ideas and these are not i hate to even use the term radical right because it's freaking common sense it's not radical it's, it, it's not, right it there's this like people deserve like dignity and people deserve autonomy to make their own choices and it's it's like a moral failing if you're unhoused or use substances and it's like no people just need to get their basic needs met and if someone does get their basic needs met and they still want to use substances who fucking cares that, like if that's how they're happy yeah. or fulfilling you can live a fulfilled life and still use substances and it's this giant misconception that you have to be abstinent or sober or move to softer drugs to be happy and you don't you can live a fulfilling life and not be abstinent mm -hmm. so. no yeah i yeah you and i are definitely on the same page there these are all things that a lot of people take for granted and everybody needs access to these basic these most basic needs and then to what we were talking about in the beginning with inflation and just with the lack of resources and the lack of assistance and having to do mutual aid i mean mutual aid was literally a response to the lack of involvement or care or basically giving a shit about people you know and, and having left people behind and harm reduction uh, so much of like what i talk about within my own community and living here in connecticut and with people who this is not even a thought to them because they have so much privilege and they walk around with so much privilege it's just it's literally not just giving someone narcan and being like great job because i know that that person is probably never going to see somebody overdose because they're not in an environment like we know that it's like over 80 percent or something like that that folks using drugs are larger the ones who are reviving and reversing these overdoses and responding to them right so it's like that doesn't hurt that much yes same thing with the fentanyl test strips i'm not going to waste you know a lot of supplies that you know certain organizations don't have the funding to provide and give yeah. it to people who are maybe knowingly using fentanyl because that's a waste instead we're going and giving it to people using stimulants who are quote-unquote mm -hmm. opioid naive right because yeah it's it's in just so many things yeah and getting it yes getting it into the hands of people using substances and their families and friends are like the biggest like you know we go around and we do trainings with a lot of the bars and music venues out here because like everyone should have it you don't yeah. know when it's going to be needed yeah. um but like it, it is largely important and the reason we do do the the distribution out to like bars and venues and stuff is so we can do harm reduction training with with the staff like let's be real they're at a bar it's just a supervised consumption site of another substance so yeah. um you don't know when someone is gonna take something that they think is an oxy and it's a blue and then they're drinking and it's exacerbated so like people need to know but the priority still needs to be into the hands of people who are using substances. Absolutely. I couldn't agree more. Oh my goodness. Um, I mean, that's all I have for now, unless you have anything you want to leave us with, but I appreciate you just being so willing. I know we had a lot of setbacks, right? You had, <laughs> you had an injury going on, wild stuff happening, but we made it. You know, we're here, <laughs> here, we're still here. We're doing it. Um, I think maybe one of the, one of the last questions I have since now it's really had some time to develop, but in your own words, um, how, what have you gotten kind of out of the experience of being part of Lighthouse or part of the collective and, and kind of like what's been your favorite thing so far? Yeah. Um, honestly, like I just love seeing the connection. Um, I love being connected with other like queer and trans folks who have the same passion because for a long time, like now, now I know this, but when I was younger, I had no idea how deeply rooted harm reduction was in queer history and like how important finding this community is because I felt like in Phoenix, there wasn't a ton of queer people talking about this. Um, and there was a ton of queer people using substances. So 
the fact to find other like like-minded people who have had similar experiences across the U.S. like that's that's amazing. Yeah. Um, so yeah. thank you. You really helped bring people together, and I appreciate it. No, and I appreciate you because what I always tell people too is um, I like to get the feedback because I like to know what we need to retool. It's probably being an overachiever. But at the same time, it would be absolutely nothing without people like you and the other folks who have come and and the growth, right? Like the fact that the group asked for a learning series, which this is a shameless plug for the Lighthouse Learning Series. It's going to be coming in January, which you can see on our Instagram, social media. But um, that idea didn't just come from my head. Like that was an idea that collectively, hence the name of the group, right, came together and said, like, we want to see these things. And you know, it's just a way to provide additional resources and education to our community and to other folks. Cause we know that it's not just going to be us consuming. Right. Yeah. And it's, and it's been really great being able to bounce ideas off because there's people of all, all backgrounds. So like, yeah. I don't have any, I don't have a ton of like formal education. Everything is just like lived experience. And it feels good to be welcomed in a space like that. That's so like public health and like there is a lot of like academic centric, you know, views when it comes to, to harm reduction, but it's really good to, to be in a group where I, I, I feel like I still have meaningful input without going to school. So, or Absolutely. being able to go to school. Absolutely. And that's the whole thing too. Like you do not need to have an MHA, MPH, BA, associate, whatever it is, you know, what everybody brings something to the table. And that's really the space that we like to cultivate. And that's why I always tell, like, I will shut up. Like, I don't want to hear myself speak over and over again. Like, my goal is to make sure that other people feel comfortable stepping into their power and doing what they want to do, doing what they're impassioned by. And my job is to really provide those resources and that support and facilitate it. And like we were talking about in the beginning, it all comes back to preparing the next generation of queer harm reductionists to take over and to take charge and to really push this movement forward from what our ancestors have done. Because to your point, you know, talking about uh, the queer history of harm reduction, that's where it started. And a lot of times that gets pushed to the side. Like when we're talking, talking about ACT UP, we're talking about the 80s, we're talking about HIV and we're talking about AIDS and, you know, SSPs and, and, and everything. Like that's where it started from our communities. Yeah, and, and so much of it is just engulfed in queer history. And I think that's a really beautiful thing that this community has cultivated, bringing so many different types of people together um, and, you know, really being able to like lean on anyone in, in the community, even if they're from a different background than you, so. Absolutely. Wow, that was a really good note to end on. It's almost like this was scripted or something, but. <laughs> Thank you to Arlo. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you. I appreciate you having me on, so.